Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk, back again with you guys for another show for another episode of our Let's Talk Arsenal series and the Arsenal Transfer Podcast, where I'm joined each week by a few people uh, to talk about the ups and downs of the transfer window and try to make some sense of what's been going on. And as it is a Tuesday, it does, of course, mean that our show is sponsored by Football Prizes, which is a fantastic website in which you can win some brilliant stuff, as have both of the guests that I've got on the show today. Um, so to show you what this week's prize is, uh, if I just throw it over here, uh, this week's prize, I believe, is a signed Freddie Jungberg shirt. It is indeed. Uh, so you can actually get your hands on this, signed by Freddie Jungberg himself. Uh, there's 99 tickets available. And the website wants to work. There we go. It's clicking finally. And uh, so far, we have seen how many have been sold. Only 18 tickets sold so far. And it runs out on Friday. So you've got a really good chance of winning this prize if you do want to be in with an opportunity. But without further ado, let's go and grab my guest. First of all, it's the man who's not just won one prize, but he's won two. Jared, how you doing, mate? Are you well? Are you good? Hey, Tom. Glad to be back on with you. And I've actually won three Arsenal prizes now. I feel like oh every time gosh. I buy a ticket, wow. the number just gets pulled. So, What's the third one you won? Because I know you've won Bergkamp and what was the other one? Uh, I got the Pepe shirt. And then yeah. like two days later, I decided I felt pretty lucky. I bought a ticket and I got not a shirt, but a signed photo mount from Seth Fabregas. Oh, my so God. <laughs> I, really, and I really don't have anywhere to put it. So the Pepe one, I'll find a spot down here for the Sesk one. We'll probably uh, I'll be sending out in some sort of raffle or donation coming up pretty soon so everybody can keep an eye out for that i mean and our, our next guest thought he was pretty lucky in winning a signed pierre mabamiang uh, photo montage but uh, dan i mean are you feeling pretty let down now that you've not won as many as uh, as jared has yeah i think your three prizes puts my abamiang to shame really i think i need to it's... get on that that limbo one I mean, the Lumbo one is very, very nice, of course, and fingers mm. crossed to anyone who ends up going in for that. Uh, of course, used to be our manager back in uh, 20, I want to say 19, I think it was, before Mikel Arteta eventually took over, of course. So lots of interesting stuff to talk about today. Uh, and of course, the transfer window continues to move forward and move on in some crazy and interesting ways. I'm going to ask you more generally about it first, Jared. Talk to me about how, how your feelings are now the European Championships are over. We're on the 13th. It's our first game of preseason. One backup signing made only. How are you feeling about it all? Pr pretty okay. I think actually the last time I was on with you, we were right at the start of the transfer window. And one of the questions we got was, you know, how many signings do you think we'll make in June? And my guess was one. I think we ended up with zero, but we're still not, not that far off where I thought we'd be. You're only one away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I kind of figured most of our business would be done in July. I, I will say I thought we would maybe have more of the outgoing sorted since we had some players not playing in the Euros that we, we kind of all assume are on their way out. So I was mm. expecting maybe a couple of those to already be completed. But in, in terms of incomings, we're really not that far off where I thought we'd be. And I think the next you know week or two, it'll really start to ramp up because – we're already, you know, what, four or six weeks out from the start of the season. So it's it's coming up fast. Yeah, it really is. It's really kind of closing in on us already because I think we're now a month, uh, basically spot on a month away from our first game against, uh, I want to say Brentford. I'm pretty sure it's Brentford. And uh, it's going to be really interesting how kind of these preseason games, I suppose, kind of mirror the way in which we're going to look to play because Dan we've obviously got a lot of our starting 11 aren't going to be available at the start of the season with likely Bakaya Saka uh, Gabriel's injured of course Martinelli's going to be away uh, you've got players like Granit Xhaka that we don't know whether or not he's going to be here and what kind of players are going to be brought in by that point do you think that having so many uncertainties will play into how Mikel Arteta kind of structures the preseason formations? And do you think he'll try different experiments or do you think he'll try and use the formation that he plans on using on that day one? I can imagine that what we'll see today against Hibs will be essentially a similar formation as to what we're going to go for. So I'd like to think it will be a 4-2-3-1. A lot of the first team are there in Scotland, so you I've seen Aubameyang, Lacazette, Pepe, Partey, Smith-Rowe, Willock. I've seen a lot of kind of the midfield and attack and even in defence, although I don't know where Rob Holding is. But a lot of them mm. are there. So we can always, we can kind of mould what we want to see. Obviously, without players like Tierney and then Saka and then without additions too, but kind of mould the formation that we want to do against Brentford, essentially. 
It's very difficult to kind of guess, I suppose, what players are going to be used during the games because uh, it, it, it's really difficult to know from the pictures who's gone, who hasn't gone. Omar Rekic is assumed to have gone because of an image he put up on his Instagram page, but he's in none of the actual promotional yeah, yeah. pictures. Is he's he in, in them? The videos. Oh, yeah. he's in the videos. Okay, there you go. I so see Dan, Dan's just more clued in with this stuff than I am. So. <laughs> but I've not seen, there's a few that, I mean, you say you haven't seen Rob Holding. I've not seen him anywhere. And I haven't heard no. about an injury for him at all. Maybe he's recovering from a hair transplant surgery. Maybe that's still <laughs> happening. Um, but other than that, I I've, I've can't work out some of the ones. Balogun, I've seen in a couple of photos. So we assume that he's going to be there. Um, but we haven't got some key players that we've talked about already. But interestingly, Jared, there are players there that, I didn't expect to see at this point in the window. Saya Kalasinac is there. Hector Bellerin is there. We've got players that Eddie Nketiah as well. Reese Nelson is all there. Do you think that that's any kind of indication that they could be staying or do you still expect those to be moved on? I hope that it's not. Uh, when I said I expected a few outgoings in July, basically those are the list of names, the guys mm. that we all kind of expect to, to, to move out this window. So I think them being there is just part of, you know, you're a professional. As long as you're on the team, you're expected to be in training and, and kind of go through the motions and be available for these things. And for them, you know, it's it still is preseason for them. Maybe not for here, but for whatever team they get moved to. So as a matter of getting kind of back into game shape, been getting your feet underneath you, you know, I think we'll see them play a little bit. Probably not nearly as much as some of the younger guys. You know, I don't. You wouldn't think that Hector Bellerin, would, for example, would play a big role in these preseason games. You know, he may get a few minutes here and there, but he's one that, you know, he's requested a transfer. He's put in the request. He's almost certainly going to be on his way out. So I think mm -hmm. if he is used on the trip, it'll be in a, in a pretty minimal manner, which is fine. You know, it's he's still a member of the team. So he's kind of just being a professional, fulfilling his obligation to be there. And, and that's fine. He's not really causing any problems. He can show up, do his thing, and everything will be good when he... uh finds a team to uh, move to that is an arsenal. Yeah, when I saw Willian in those photographs, it was a it was one to make your heart sink a little bit. Um, that deal to Inter Miami, of course, we we from what we know is seemingly fallen through, and it was his wage demands that were surprise, surprise, the reason behind him not making that deal. Um, it's a really difficult one with Willian, but there are some other players that I've got uncertainties around them, and one is Granite Xhaka Dan. Obviously, we've seen that uh, he's finished his time with Switzerland now. He's he's back kind of on his holiday period and recovery, and and at the moment will be returning to Arsenal for pre-season training because there is no deal agreed with Roma. There is continuous kind of talks ongoing, but Arsenal have remained firm on this one. Are you happy to see Arsenal kind of sticking their ground on this one or do you think it's a bit of a risky strategy in case we never end up selling? In all honesty, I just want him gone. But I, I, <laughs> I, every, I think everyone knows my kind of views on Granite Xhaka. I'm not the biggest fan, but I, I do understand where Arsenal are coming from. He's had a good Euro tournament. Okay, maybe he's had an all, all right season, barring a few displays against Burnley mm. and a, a bit of a strangling. And what, what, what else did he do? But uh, telling the fans to f off and Chris uh, Wood, uh, yeah, Chris, exactly. Strangling That's, Chris Wood, yeah. Just <laughs> not a, it's not a great CV. So uh, I just want to see the back of him. But if we're not getting twenty million, then maybe we do stick. Because I think we need to be ruthless. We need to get the uh, enough money essentially from these player sales. And mm. if if uh, if they're being okay, here's ten million, here's fifteen million. I think eventually they might get up to twenty. It might just take a while. It might just be one of those deadline de day deals. Oh, so if it's one of those, if it's one of those, <laughs> it's taken that uh, long for Arsenal to move out their players. I can imagine be, a lot. Well, I can imagine a lot of our transfer, transfer targets, and I mean the James Madison and whatever we've got is going to be very near the end of uh, the transfer window. Jared, does that annoy you? Because we heard from like Edu and Arteta, they talked about the fact that there's this plan is the word that they used. They knew what there was going to happen. We imagine that the likes of Emi Buendia may have been part of that plan. We may be the possibility of James Madison being there. We don't know, obviously, what the plan was. But you can tell from some of the transfer targets the route in which they were going. And the fact that we are now at our first preseason game and we've brought no starting players into the club, does it annoy you that it's taking kind of this long? It's a little bit disappointing. Um, I know every, everybody always has a plan until something doesn't go right, and then you, you're trying to figure it out. As far as our window, 
the one thing that annoys me about it is after last season, we had such a poor start and we saw that even playing very well the last, you know, five full months of the season playing very well in terms of our points in the league standings, it wasn't enough to off- offset that bad start. So you would think coming off of a season like that, they would put a lot of importance on getting the team together, um, having the team built, get them in practice, get some continuity and be ready to go on match week one, or certainly in the first couple of weeks to try and hit the ground running this coming season. Because if anybody should know how detrimental it is to, to have a poor start after this past season, it's Arsenal. So for me this summer, that was one of the things I really wanted to see was us get out in front of it and, and do some of our business early and have the team ready to go. And, you know, there's still plenty of time. We may sign two or three players in the next two weeks and, you know, feel a lot better about our situation. But as it is right now, it is a little disappointing that we're a little bit behind pace, I feel like, for where I wanted us to be getting ready for for the upcoming season. Yeah, I think we are certainly are behind right now, which is it is frustrating, and it is you want to see kind of Arsenal push for players, and and there is an element of seeing Arsenal push. We've been linked to a lot, and there are a number of players that we're kind of expecting to get done. Sambu Lukonga looks like it's pretty much nailed on at this point. He's been in London, medical's been completed, and all of that. And now he's going through quarantine. Ben White is the other big one, of course, going around at the moment. And despite some links coming out from kind of the Brighton local media that Arsenal are yet to kind of agree a fee, there is still this ever growing confidence, especially especially amongst like the Arsenal main reporters like Chris Wheatley, that it's growing ever closer to being completed. So that's looking like a a done deal. But for me, the the main areas about this window have been uh, the central midfield area, and then you look at the attacking midfield area. And whilst, Dan, you mentioned obviously links to James Madison, that in itself is a really kind of speculative kind of situation. and, And you don't really know if Arsenal would ever be able to stump up the money that it would take for him. And in midfield, we've seen links to the likes of Ruben Neves, etc. But it's it's a weird one that we're not pushing harder to get those two deals done earlier, do you not think? Yeah, probably. But I think with something like James Madison, do we necessarily need him? And I think maybe Arteta wants to see what Smith Rowe does in pre-season, if, how his fitness levels are. Because... I, I'm a huge fan of Smith Rowe and I think he can be even better than James Madison and better than Grealish and maybe that's me being a bit mm. biased. But I love what I see from Smith Rowe and if he plays in that 10 position, I think he's got all the abilities to be brilliant in that role. And if he does get his injury injury knocked, we've got the Joe Willock if he stays. The Kyo Saka could probably play in that role. I don't necessarily feel like we need a £60 million pound signing. So maybe Arteta is just kind of waiting to see what happens rather than splashing that right now and then realising that actually maybe we didn't need to spend £60 million on Madison. I wouldn't mind a £15 million signing on an attacking midfield in case smith gets injured, but even then I'm not necessarily saying that that's what we should be doing. It's What frustrates me, I suppose, the most of all is that Yes, you don't want to rush things. Yes, you don't want to end up getting a player that isn't necessarily going to have that impact that you you want them and you need them to have. Need is the, is the word for Arsenal specifically this summer. But it's more about the idea of this this plan. That's what I can't get out of my head is that the fact that the club have said they've had this plan and yet we're not seeing bids go in that we, we're aware of. We're not seeing kind of a, a really aggressive stance on, on certain positions. Does, do you think, Jared, that there was a case in point where the number one position for the attacking midfield was Martin Erdegaard. And then that basically not happening has had a really kind of big setback on what they've wanted to do this window in that position. Yeah, I think 100% coming into this year, the plan was to try and get Martin Odegaard back. It's a little mm-hmm. disappointing that we couldn't because I think he's really well liked by Arteta. I think he feels like he fits his system well and he's well liked by the team. And in addition, you know, he's already kind of implemented himself and would be able to you know, jump right in. There's no kind of delay of a guy getting accustomed to the league and the team and all that if we're able to get him back. So mm. that's kind of a big hit to to not get him this summer. And I think they may have, you know, they've obviously got a list. I'm sure there's, you know, 10 players deep, a list at every position of potential targets this summer. And I think once Odegaard fell through, maybe next priority on the list wasn't, you know, whoever they have second on the list for Cam. And it may have been you know, a defensive midfielder, a central midfielder, you know, we've, we've got a lot of spots to fill. So I think Odegaard was the plan. And once that went away, I think kind of next on the list, if we weren't able to get him 
would be, let's go ahead and, and look at these other positions in the midfield we need to fill. Because like Dan said, we do have Emil Smith Rowe, really, really talented. I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. I'm not sure with his injury record, if we want to go into the season counting on him to play 38 games, um, I'm not sure how realistic that is. And as good as he is, he is still, is he 20 now? I was going to say a teenager, but yeah. really, really young. So there's not many teams in the league that are starting a 20-year-old in the number 10 spot week in, week out. So I, I'd, I'd like to have some cover there. And I think we will see some. Uh, but yeah, I think we're to the point now where we may see our bigger signings and, you know, the number six or number eight roles and, and maybe more of a, a role player, number 10, maybe a backup to Smith Rowe. And maybe it won't be the big splash signing that we thought maybe it would be at the start of the window. Mm. I, I don't think it's going to be from the looks of things anyway it looks like this is one that's going to be dragged out towards the end and it may even happen after the start of the season which will be frustrating of course but if you're asking me would I rather Arsenal got the right man at the end of the window or a backup plan now you, you probably lean towards the, the right person of course wouldn't you mm -hmm. um, Sam Trester in the chat was thank you so much for the donation um, one of our longest term listeners and, and real loyal supporters of the channel says just popped in to say smash a like on the video hashtag no room for racism hashtag stop the online abuse Hashtag come on you gunners. Can't wait to watch this show on playback. Thanks, Sam. Much appreciate that, fella. And uh, you'll also be able to watch live, fingers crossed, our first ever on the channel, real intended watch along, which is something I never thought I was going to do. Uh, I genuinely never thought I was going to do that, but uh, a few people seem to like the idea, so we're going to test it. It's our own pre-season, if you like. I'm going to be joined by Drew and Owen uh, for the game against Hibernian. Fingers crossed we can sort out everything by uh, kickoff. It's been a bit of a, a chaotic afternoon getting everything ready in the short period of time I've had. Um, but yeah, that's going to be interesting. So make sure you tune in uh, for that one. Now, interestingly, George Davies, one of our members in the chat box, uh, suggested that uh, Lukonga could be sent on loan and that there were some reports going on. So whilst um, you guys were talking, I was just trying to do some digging on this. Now, Sport Witness has the report. They tweet through uh, Sport Magazine, uh, who I've, I'm not familiar with, uh, but it is a Belgian outlet. So, you know, sometimes these can be relatively uh, reliable. And it's according to that, it says the midfielder impending move from Anderlecht today could be followed up with a, uh, a loan uh, in terms of kind of adjusting to the Premier League and possibly a loan move to another Premier League club to help him to adapt. Now, I don't know what you make of this one. Do you think, Dan, this is... Is that a good decision? Do you think it's the right thing to give him regular game time to transition this season first? Or do you think he's good enough that he should be coming in ahead of the likes of El Nenny, ahead of the likes of some of the other youngsters and, and being used as depth for the squad this season? I haven't seen enough of La Conga to know if he's as good mm. as what we've got. But I would love to see him get given the chance at Arsenal. Because we all know Partey, he, yeah, he's great, but he, he's got his injury kind of record so we might need Lukonga and then if we send him out on loan who do we have to back up Partey it also depends on our other signings if we're bringing two other midfielders I, I don't know if we will do then maybe maybe Arteta and Edu's got a point to send him out alone to get him the 38 games under his under his belt at a, a Newcastle or Crystal Palace a team mm. like that and then he can come back next season fully adapted to the Premier League, which may be good for next season, but at the same time, I want I want to see Lukonga now. And I agree with Marco in the chat, Saliba 2.0. It does smell a bit of the whole Saliba deal. If you're buying a player for quite a bit of money to play yeah. in the first team and then just sending him on, out on loan, it's almost like, what's the point? So, yeah, I, I would like to see Lukonga stay personally. So would I. I'd like to see him stay. Um, it's it's all about the justification behind the reasoning and and that. And if they come out and say the reason why they're going to send him on loan, which they haven't done for the whole Saliba situation, it's been very private, very quiet, and we won't really hear about that until Arteta's asked. And even then, it's most likely that he'll be pretty coy about the answer in itself. The thing about Lukonga is that I look at this guy and from researching him, from watching him and from speaking to people that genuinely do know plenty about him, they believe him to be good enough to, to kind of force his way into an Arsenal eleven to get into that Arsenal team. And if you think about the fact that this guy has rejected other offers from Italy, from clubs like Atalanta, etc., I don't think Atalanta would have been planning on loaning this guy out. So 
you'd hope anyway that Arsenal are very much in their bid to sign him, would have outlined their plans to him of how they see him kind of integrating into the team. If he is going to go out on loan, then you'd hope that he was made fully aware of that fact before they've made that decision. Now, we are only going to be on for about 20 more minutes or so. I have sent a couple of texts out just to see if I can get any kind of response from any of the people that I know that might know. So if they do respond between now and the end of the show, then I'll tell you. If not, it'll be in the uh, watch along a little later or the AM show tomorrow. So we'll see if we can get an answer for you guys on that one because that is a, you know, it worried me a little bit. Jerry, what's your kind of immediate reaction to hearing that news? I would say it would definitely surprise me if he went out on loan. I, mm. I think he's one that we signed to, to play a role this year. You know, he'll probably start some of the FA Cup, Carabao Cup games. And, you know, be a squad player for our Premier League season. And if we need to have guys that need a rest, I think there's going to be a role for him there. I think he's at a level he's certainly not going to jump in and be in our starting 11 every week. But I think there's going to be minutes available for him. Um, if he does go out on loan, I, I wouldn't be mad if he went to a Premier League team. He can develop. He is still a young player. But that means we've got even more work to do this summer because we'd have to sign another midfielder to kind of fill that spot. And we've already got yeah. a, a list a mile long. Uh, of players we need to sign. I think the mm. only other option, and and I don't think this is the case because I think Lakanga will stay. If we do send him out on loan, it you know potentially is a sign that Edu's getting the feeling that maybe all these outgoings aren't going to happen, and you know someone like Granite Xhaka, for example, is staying. You know, in, in that case, maybe there's not going to be the minutes there that they originally thought there would be. So this is all well down the road. <laughs> you know, we've still got a lot of time to figure it out. But just as in general given his level currently, I would be a little bit surprised if Lakanga went out on loan this summer. I expect him to stay. Sticking with the midfield then, Dan, a uh, report that emerged today uh, from The Sun, uh, so, you know, take it with your pinch of salt, uh, but from Jordan Davies, um, has said that Arsenal's uh, technical director, Edu, is in consistent contact with uh, George Mendes, or Jorge Mendes, uh, of uh, the agent of Ruben Neves from Wolves, and certainly one that they seemingly want to get done. Now, I don't see this really happening until we've moved on Jacker, because it doesn't make too much sense to, to bring a midfielder in until you've moved on the midfielder you need to move on um but how do you feel about ruben neves as a possible uh incoming and, and that being kind of a, a profile that arsenal are seemingly pursuing i've always really liked ruben neves when it, when he's at wolves uh, i like mm. how he plays and i think he's the right age profile as well uh, i think he's much uh, more of a leader as well to jacques i know jacques got given the keys when he was younger but i think that ruben neves is i mean he was wasn't he captain at is it Porto or something? Yes. He's got a good shot on him. He's got a good passing range. And instead of, I know Hajaka, he always likes to keep hold of the ball and draws for fouls. But Neves actually drives a bit forward and will actually create an attack more than Xhaka does. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm hoping as well that he's less error prone as well and has a better, kind of better mentality about him. So I, I, I really got behind this this Ruben Neves thing. And I think he could be a great partner for Partey. But then again, what, what I want to see is an out-and-out out number six, someone who just sits in front of the back four and doesn't need to attack. And that's where I cut. I keep thinking towards Ben White. I know we're bringing him to be a centre-back, but I'd love, I'd love him to be in that defensive midfield role. I don't know how you think about that. Neves specifically in a central defence midfield role? Or... Well, I, I, I was saying Ben White in that role. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, in terms of Ben White, it's it's difficult because I've not seen a lot of Ben White play in that position. I've only seen him play at centre-back and play at, uh, at, at right-back and kind of like deputised when Tarek Lamptey was out. So I've heard that he's played a number of games there, but I just don't think I've seen enough of him to really say, yeah, that's the right decision. If we're spending 50 million plus quid on a player that's you know course, by yeah. trade a center back I, I struggle to know why you would risk playing him out of position i mean jared what do you think yeah i know he's played in the defensive midfield on a handful of occasions but you know the number six role if we're going to have someone there and play two eights around it is a pretty important piece and i think like you said if we're going to spend 50 ish million on a player to fill that spot i think we would probably go for someone more in the mold of a Basuma who's really tailored to that position. I, I do mm. think that's one of the nice things about Ben White is that he definitely has versatility and, you know, we can use him in a number of areas if we need to, but I don't think our plan going in right now would be to start him at number six, in, in my opinion. Maybe not, no. 
No, I, it's, I think it would be a little bit risky uh, if we were to go and do that and, and play. I just feel he's got. I just feel he's got all the abilities to be great there. His passing range is excellent. He mm. drives forward. I, uh, I, I really would think he would be great there. But I do understand. I'm sure he's been brought in as that centre back to play alongside a Gabriel. But mm. we'll, we'll have to see. I guess what happens. Yeah. No, we will. We will. We'll have to wait and see. Anyway, for the last 15 minutes or so of the show, we are going to answer as many of your questions in the chat box as feasibly possible. So if you do have a question, try and throw it into the chat box. We're going to go for as many as we can so if we can keep our answers as condensed as we can, guys. That would be fantastic. So, uh, Jared, starting with uh, you and Talex uh, in the chat, says, Hi, Tom. Just a theory about Saliba. Are we not paying him to avoid making payments to Saint-Etienne? What do you know about the deal? Now, I don't know anything, Jared. I know nothing about any irregularities or that. There's only speculation of stuff that went on. So what are your thoughts around that being a possible reason as to why we're avoiding playing him? I don't necessarily jump on and think that's the case. You know, like you, I I know nothing more than anyone else, you know, on the outside looking in. It's not out of the realm of possibility that there is some clauses in the contract about the number of games he plays, and maybe we're going to save some money if he doesn't play for Arsenal. Mm-hmm. I think it's more a matter of, you know, as good as he is, he's a 19, 20 year old center half, and you, you don't see many of them starting, you know, week in, week out in the Premier League. And I think they just want him to go out and get a full season of experience and come back. The, the whole thing with him has been kind of a circus. You know, he hasn't been well handled, certainly. You don't yeah. expect a team like Arsenal, who's usually a little bit looked at as, not people always say we're cash strapped, so you, you don't expect us to spend 30 million on a player, give him the number four shirt, and he not play for three years. I don't think any of us would have anticipated that, but you know, things constantly change. There's always a lot of moving parts, you know. That was well, like I said, while it's not impossible, I think mm. it's more a matter of they just want him to go out and get a full season's worth of experience starting week in, week out. Yeah, I tend to agree that that is probably uh, the reason behind it. I think there is some issues with obviously the social aspect of it, but I don't think we'll ever find out about those. Uh, Dan, Brad Roberts, uh, sorry, Brad Robert, uh, Brad Richardson says, uh, Arsenal, uh, do you think Arsenal are going to sign a big player because of the all or nothing series for good PR? I can't imagine that would be a reason why we might bring in a big player, but it would be, it would be brilliant. I'm really excited for all or nothing, personally. I, I watched the Tottenham version and I just found it a bit of a comedy. But just the way they go into everything, I, I'm really excited. And maybe a yeah. big signing would just kind of start it off. Great episode number one. Jared, what are your thoughts on the on the documentary? Because obviously, from what I've experienced, I was very happy about it and I was kind of buzzing to see it. But a lot, there's been a lot of backlash online about the whole idea. I absolutely love it. I'm a huge sports <laughs> documentary fan and I love the All or Nothing series. I, I think... I've seen the Man City one the whole way through probably three times. Absolutely oh, really? love it. Wow. It's such a well put together series. It gives you a good insight. And the Tottenham one I did watch once. Uh, it, it's pretty funny. Mourinho is such a such a character. He makes yeah. for good television. But it was one I was surprised. I would always hope we would get Arsenal on there, but I figured with all the teams out there, you know, it, it was pretty unlikely. So I was really yeah. excited to hear it's happening. I'm looking forward to it. And. I know one of the comments is people say, what if it's detrimental to the team? What if it has a negative impact? And the one thing I would say to that is, you know, we know when Man City did it, Mikel Arteta was on that staff. He featured on the show in a small way. So he's been up close and personal and knows what to expect. So I think one thing we can say to kind of give solace to those people who are worried about it affecting performance is he knows exactly what it is. And if he thought it was going to be detrimental to the performance of the team, you know, likely he would have stepped up and, and said, we shouldn't be doing this because of, of all years, he can't afford a, a a bad performance. It's this one because it might be his last if things don't go to plan. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, there is a real possibility that he could lose his job during the series, which is, I mean, we won't see any mm-hmm. of it. Like I imagine we didn't with the Pochettino thing either, but um, it, it's a real possibility that, that could happen. And Arsenal specific, do you, I don't know if this is the right thing to kind of question about it, but do you think that there's an element of, not thinking that they would make a decision knowing that it would look bad through an Amazon series. And that could be a change of manager. It could be a decision to drop captaincy or change something like that. Or something, just something controversial. Do you think, Jared, that would change anything about the way they operated? 
I, I don't think it will. And like I said, I don't know exactly the structure of these and the production of them, but I'm certain that there's at least some level of editorial discretion that Arsenal has. Now, it may not mm. be a lot. I don't think they're going to be deciding what goes into every episode or anything like that. But I think there's going to be enough on their side where they've got pull that anything that's going to come off in an extraordinarily negative light, they'll they'll come in and, you know, maybe at, at least downplay, if not try and omit. But, you know, in general, the series give you a pretty good look. It seems like you see some good, some bad. You hear from fans, which will be very interesting on the Arsenal side. Uh, they usually have some local people recurring uh, on these series that they talk to throughout. So it'll be interesting to see who they get from Arsenal and kind of what their reaction is to everything the club does. Because if there's one thing Arsenal fans do, it's have outsized reactions to absolutely everything. So that, that part will be really interesting for me. But because I think they'll have a little bit of editorial say, I don't think it's really going to change the, the way that the team's operating in any real way. It's going to be a really intriguing one about how decisions look and how they come across during the series. So I look forward to that. Uh, we've got eight minutes. Let's try and really kind of speed through as many of these as possible. Uh, Rob in the chat, I've just noticed, I'm going to try and get your question back in a second. It's just, you know, that thing where it just clicks off the screen because there's so many coming through. But Rob said, what do you think Dan Smith Rowe's squad number is going to be? Like I said before, I, I love Smith Rowe. I really, really wanted to get the number 10 shirt. Have you seen the mm. images? Recently. I have an on it well, yeah. on a slipper or something as the yes. number ten. But I, I I also have a feeling it won't be number ten if we are gonna go for a bigger signing. I also don't think it will be eight because surely that's gonna go to a a Thomas Partey partner. Mm. Will it be eleven? I hope not, because I want Martinelli to be eleven. So ten's the only option for me. I really want that to happen. Uh, let's go to Josh Hunter. Jared, who says, would you take Johnston uh, as a backup, the West Brom goalkeeper? I would. As far as a backup goalkeeper, I don't want us to go out and have a huge expenditure if we're if Leno's going to be our number one. And he's another homegrown player. So, you know, he kind of ticks all the boxes I look for this year in a backup. So, yeah, I'd happily take him. I think he's definitely a good option for Arsenal considering his price and the fact he's homegrown for sure. Uh, George Davies, Dan says, question, what do you three expect? And I'm specifically focusing on you for this one, Dan. A realistic output from Pepe is this season. Do you think he should be giving the starting spot for 15 plus league games? I mean, that's, that's not really the starting spot. I'd say 35 plus league games. <laughs> I think he has to be a mainstay. Him and Sacco on the wings needs to happen every game. Ideally, what do I expect from him? I think what we... What we all expect from him is to actually play a huge part in all the games and actually get maybe 10 goals, 10 assists or mm. hopefully more. But I just want him to be involved and I want the consistency. I don't want him to be good on one game and then drop out for the next three. I want to see it every game. And it doesn't need to be in a goal or an assist, but just involvement, just be a part of, of how we play. Yeah, 100%. I would like to see Pepe kind of really given the emphasis to be Arsenal's main right winger, play him every single game there. Like If he has a bad two games, don't just drop him. Like You need to persist with Pepe, and he's just one of those that I think really needs to be given that, uh, that responsibility. Um, let's go to Ed, who says, who are you most looking forward to seeing make an impact in this preseason? Jared, answer this as long as you like, because I can feel a sneeze coming. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> So I'll take as long as you like for that. <laughs> yeah. um, these initial games, you know, I don't, I'd don't. i like to see Reese Nelson come out and play well, may earn himself a good loan, get, maybe get him to a championship side or someone where he can play a good amount of minutes. Uh, for the entire preseason, hopefully Ben White. Uh, I hope he comes in. He'll, he would come in on the very back end. You know, I'm sure he'll have a holiday coming up. Uh, and, and Lokanga, he's one who I don't know anything about. Admittedly, I don't watch Anderlecht play at all. But I hear a lot of good things. And, you know, the of course, like everyone else, I get on YouTube to, to watch a, a highlight video and see. It kind of gives you an idea of the ceiling of what we can expect. You see all the little bits that are his best. And, and there's definitely a talented player there. So I kind of look forward to, to seeing him a couple times and maybe getting a good feel for the level he's at right now. Can I add yeah, to that? for sure. Go, of course I'm you can. I didn't end up sneezing, so you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really looking forward to see... Omari Hutchinson, if he gets his game time. Mm. I think he's been brilliant in the under 18s in the last year or two. I really want to see him play. He's a right winger, left footed, got a good shot on him, fast. I'd love to see him get some minutes today mm. against the next game. Who knows? But I think he's really got a lot of talent. 
I think for me, following Balogun is always going to be the one. I look at him as our future striker and uh, playing with as many first team players as possible is going to be big for him. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, Suraj says, uh, Jared, do you think Willock will start for us if he has a great preseason? It's possible, depending on how long we take to do our summer business. You know, we, we may still be, you know, into match week one before we're, we're done making our signing. So I think it's possible. Mm. Uh, I've been on the team that if there's a, a good money deal available, I would be willing to sell Joe Willick this summer. I think, you know, we, we always criticize the team for selling poorly and then turn around and say, there's no way we can sell Joe Willick because he played eight good games. I, I don't think those two things really go together. I think if we could move him on to, you know, anyone who wants to pay 25 plus million, I'd, I'd certainly be open to selling him. But if he, if he is here, I think he's got talent. Certainly we lack goals in the midfield. So a lot makes sense. Um, if we sign an out and out number six to where Thomas Party's playing an eight, I could see him playing an eight alongside him and maybe going that route. In a four, two, three, one, I, I'm just never sure on Willick because he's certainly not going to sit his back as part of a midfield pivot, but I don't see him as an out and out number 10 either. He's more of a maybe substitute player can come on, create some chaos, create some shots and, and something like that. So I'm just not sure where exactly he fits in. And my preference would be if a deal comes in that we, that we move him on this summer. Yeah, me too. I think that it'll be a case of the preseason is going to be so key. But if a sizable bid comes in from anyone, not just Newcastle, I think it will be very, very seriously kind of considered for sure. Uh, last question then uh, from Taylor, who says, they say we overpaid, but with the benefit of hindsight based on the past two seasons, what would have been a fair price for Pepe, Dan? 30? It's a tough I, one. I tend because... to agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I think he's not. Jared said, "Oh, harsh. Go on. Well, unless you think, I think it's a little hard. harsh. <laughs> I just don't think he's lived up to our expectations. He's not a seventy-two million pound player. I just, mm. and I, I hope that this season he can live up to that. But just so far, he's not." Prices is really difficult because I never think that the price of a player genuinely correlates their how good they are on the pitch. Prices are all affected by age, by the club they come from, by their nationality, by all of these kind of external factors beyond just how good they are on a football pitch. So it's it's really difficult to say a fair price would have been 30. You look back now and go, well, he's he's probably been half the player that we've seen that we'd expect from a 72 million pound player. And so that's maybe why you come to that kind of 30-ish kind of figure. Um it's He's always going to get compared to that that figure. He's never going to escape that label. And it's this season for me where I just want to forget the figure. I want to forget what's gone before. I want to turn over a new slate for, for Pepe and just see him go for it and get some consistent game time. I'm hoping that Arteta is going to be the man to give it to him. We can only I've, seen in the, I've seen in the well, chat that everyone disagreeing, but how much did Rafinha sign for Leeds? It was 20 million. And I think he's so much yeah. better than Pepe. So that's where mm. I've come with 30. It's as I say, it's, it's saying a, a price is is not really something that anyone's going to be right. There's no really right or wrong answer because uh, it's such a it's such a generic way of kind of assessing a player's quality. Um, I understand the question and I understand kind of how you come to figures, but when you see certain players going, I mean, thirty million quid, we got which paid more for Mustafi uh, for that figure, and and you wouldn't say he's a thirty four million pound player as well. So it's it's really difficult to. to to judge a player based on their value. So we've just got to hope that he smashes it next season. That's all we've got to hope for. Okay. Anyway, that does bring us to the end of today's uh, Arsenal Transfer Podcast. So thank you so much, guys, for listening in, as always. Uh, as I said earlier on the show, you can pick up uh, a ticket for this week's football prize, which is, uh, if I decide to remove the overlay from the screen, a signed Freddie Jumberg shirt. Uh, there's only 18 or so tickets sold so far. So if you go onto Football Prize's website, you'll be able to find it. One of our lucky members will be getting a free ticket on Friday's show. It does run out on Friday, and then they do their draw an hour after it runs out on their Facebook page. So make sure you do go check it out because it's going to be a really interesting prize that you could being with a chance of winning. Uh, I'm now going to take the opportunity to thank my amazing panel of guests from today's show. First of all, Jared, absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been a while, but I'm glad we've been able to facilitate you to get back on again. Yeah, definitely. It's been a little bit, but I've been looking forward to jumping back on with you and talking a little Arsenal summer business. And it's nice to get on and, and do a show with Dan as well. Yeah, I mean, Dan, I mean, I don't know if you've got to start your lighting because I know I'd sort of my lighting. I go down the other end of the spectrum where I'm really dark, but you've got the complete other way. And you just illuminated <laughs> heavenly. I, I have a window right in front of me, which probably doesn't <laughs> help. 
But no, it's been great. I've been told to put a window in front of me, but then I see the effect on you, and maybe it's not the right way to go. (laughs) We'll wait and see. We just need to start our lighting. It's it's the next stage in the TGT uh, development phase of of production. So there you go. Um, Anyway, thank you all so much, guys, for tuning in the chat. Got some fantastic questions and some really good interaction as well, as always. I'll be back with you guys in just over an hour because I'll be joined by Drew and Owen for a live reaction, watch along, if you will, uh, for the Hibernian Arsenal game. So if you aren't able to actually watch the game because you haven't got access to it, but you'd like to keep up to tabs with it, or you would just like us rather than the commentary that they're providing on the stream, then you can do uh, by watching us live on the channel. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn those notifications on so you know when it's going to go live. We're going to be over on Twitter as well at the Guna Talk TV and myself at Tom Canton Media. Other than that, if you don't join us for the watch along, I will see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. for the transfer update show where hopefully we've got lots more to talk about and maybe some indications about Emil Smith Rowe's new contract. But anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure to switch guys as always. And as always, up the Arsenal.